Hello friends, your boy Jeff here with you again. And this is the video you all have been waiting for. It's my Vinyl Tag 2020 video. Um, I've watched a couple of these Vinyl Tags. I didn't want to watch too many. I didn't want to be influenced really one way or the other with the answers to some of these questions. So if I accidentally repeat an answer that somebody else put that's completely random because, like I said, I only watched a couple just because I couldn't resist. And I had to see a few because my, some of my favorite VCers already put theirs up. So I'm finally glad to be able to have time to do it now. And then I'll be able to go back and then watch a lot of the other ones that I deliberately put off. Gonna try to all right. Babel is gonna be to a minimum. We have 20 questions here, and I have a pile of records to get through. So <clears throat> we're gonna try to get through this as quickly as we can. I have everything written down here, all the questions, and some of these. This was actually probably the most challenging vinyl tag. Just want to say before we get started that of the I think this is my third one that I've done now, and uh uh, yeah, this is probably a lot of the questions on here were were tough. So, and, and a couple answers are probably going to be a bit of a stretch. So just go with me, go with it. <laughs> Give me a little latitude here. All right. Starting off with question number one: best find of 2019. Best. Uh, this was actually VCLT. This was wasn't something that I found, something that I wanted badly, and was sent to me by Gary from Gary's Vinyl Dungeon. This is the <clears throat> MoFi one-step version of Texas Flood by Stevie Ray Vaughan, simply because this is one of my all-time favorite albums. And, you know, getting MoFi pressings is really not something that I pursue, although I would like to, simply because of the cost. And these one-step pressings on Super Vinyl Never thought I'd own. So having this in my collection, I got this, I think it was back in the spring, sometime back in the spring of 2019, was just amazing. And I've played this, you know, I've done the uh, I've done the Pepsi challenge with my OG copy, and it is nothing compared to this one. This pressing blows it away. Even though, you know, it, it's a, you have to flip the record over quick because there's only like two songs per side it's like a 45 rpm cutting still the sound quality is so good that you feel like you're in the room with stevie so this was my favorite of 2019 that or best find even though it was a present favorite album of 2019 was also a present by barack p dub this is the album Skin Shape by Phylloxony. I gifted this to Eric Weinbender for Christmas. And I think he liked this album a lot too. Um, but yeah, um, Paul Baraka P. Dub sent me a VCLT package in 2019. Um, five brand new sealed albums and they were all killer. This one was my favorite of the bunch. and But it was... It's close, you know, it's not like all five that he sent me, I, I loved, but this one, I really seem to enjoy <clears throat> more than the others and got played a lot. So this is my favorite album of 2019, even though it didn't come out in 2019, I think it came out in 2018, but still, I don't really get that many brand new albums, so this is what I went with. All right. Novelty record, question number three. I went with uh, I went with this album that Steve over at Value Vinyl sent me. This is a white label promo of Prelude in C sharp minor by Jose Eturbi, the pianist. But the special thing about this album is that it was According to what Steve told me, this was uh, one of the very first albums, oh, there goes Jinx, pressed on vinyl instead of shellac to make the trip overseas during World War II. 
And this was an album that his grandfather, if I remember correctly, brought back from overseas. And obviously it made the trip in one piece because uh, the shellac records kept breaking. So the uh, United States Army commissioned um, albums to be pressed in this new material vinyl that was a little more durable. And it made the trip. So I didn't really go for like a novelty, goofy, haha record. The novelty for this is that it's one of the first experiments in records being pressed on vinyl, which is pretty novel to me, if you think. So uh, this was a gift from, like I said, Steve over at Value Vinyl in 2019. And uh, it's a cherished part of my collection. So that's my answer for that. All right. Question number four, a homage cover, a cover that pays, you know, homage to another. This one is going to be a stretch because I had a hard time with it. So bear with me. <clears throat> if you look, Bob Dylan's Bring It All Back Home. If you look right here, you see this album. It's the, I need my glasses. I forgot what the name of the cover is. The Folk Blues of Eric Von Schmidt. It's this album right here. And you see, uh, I'll bring it in closer, so you can see kind of the picture of him holding his guitar with his hat tipping back. Now if you look at his Nashville Skyline album, a bit of a stretch I know, but you've got a picture of him holding his guitar tipping his hat back. So while it's not, while it's only an element of one cover, he pays homage with it with another. So that's my, <laughs> that's my answer because quite honestly, I don't really have, I didn't have anything in my collection that paid homage like that from one album to another. So I know it's a stretch, but go with it because that's my answer. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, question number five, a B-side or a deep cut? Neil Young's Freedom album from 1989. There is a track on here called No More, which I heard on the radio, I think, like once. And it stuck in my mind, and it was one of the reasons why I bought this album originally on cassette. So, and it's... An album that here comes the dog again and it's an album that uh, stuck in my mind so the deep cut because all my 45s are in storage so I really don't have any b-sides so I went the deep cut route and I went with the song called no more off of Neil Young's freedom album <clears throat> okay something funky cloud nine by the temptations this is a funky album Made even more so because The Temptations did not start out as a funky type of band. So their late 60s kind of psychedelic funk era period is my favorite. And I have a couple of their other albums in my Rolling Record crate that came out around the same time. But Cloud Nine is easily one of my favorite funky albums by The Temptations. Okay, uh, question number seven, Weird Shelf Buddies. Albums that seem kind of weird that are next to each other on the shelf. Let me get these here. I went with Scorpions, Love at First Sting, next to Seals and Crofts Greatest Hits, next to Bob's Secret System. <laughs> so... That seemed like a odd enough pairing of uh, albums for me. So this is where they live in my uh, on my shelf in my collection. So those easily, easily could have been whack-a-mole grabs. Okay, question number eight. I was there, a band or artist that I've seen. One of my favorite shows ever was Ellis Costello. Um, he was with the Imposters. He wasn't with the Attractions, but the Imposters are basically the Attractions with just a different bass player. So 
I picked this album because I like the cover to showcase my choice of Elvis. Would love to see Mr. Costello anytime. He always puts on a great show. And this is a great album anyway, so that's why I'm showing it. Uh, question number nine. Wish I had an OG copy, but I only have a repress. This was an easy one. <laughs> Big star. Number one record. I would love to have an original um, pressing on Ardent Records. But instead, I have the mid-80s Big Beat record label pressing. So... And also have Radio City on the same label. I picked these up at the same time. So I'd love to have that as an OG copy too. So this was one of the rare easy questions on this list. <laughs> uh, okay, question number 10. A discography you own. We are going back to Mr. Seeger. Because uh, for a while... I was obsessed with picking up his albums, and I'm just going to talk while I show. I was obsessed with picking up his albums pre-fame. Basically, sorry, got these out of order. Because um, he put out a lot of albums before this was a big this was a big get for me. Noble Records sent this one to me, and I'm still shocked that I even have it. <laughs> and... Um, Listening to these albums, this was another tough one to get. <clears throat> Shows just how much Bob Seger has changed in his musical style because a lot of these albums are very, a lot harder, um, fewer ballads, but of course, we're moving into the this is the fame uh, period now of Mr. Seeger. We got Night Moves here and Live Bullet. This is where he really broke through nationally. And then, of course, you have Stranger in Town. And my collection ends with Against the Wind. That's where it stops with Mr. Seeger. But his, uh, his pre-Night Moves Live Bullet albums are really good. And if you can find them, most of them are, are fairly easy to find. A couple, like, you know, Back in 72 or Brand New Morning, are a lot harder to find. Um, and Noah, which I've basically given up on trying to look for because it's just too hard and it's too expensive. So, but except for that album, I've got all the other ones of his that are pre-fame. So that was my answer to question number 10. <laughs> okay, question number 11. Uh, unique center label. This is the 10th anniversary of Icky Thump by the White Stripes. This is the Third Man Records Vault Edition. And aside from having beautiful vinyl, as you can see, it also has some really cool custom labels. But of course, you know, this being uh, Jack White and Third Man they usually put a lot of attention to detail in their releases. And I'll show you the center label on the other side. If I can get it without glare. And that's also pretty cool looking uh, vinyl too. But uh, he always puts, you know, something unique on his center labels. And for me, I thought this uh, 10th anniversary Icky Thump edition was pretty darn cool so that's why I went with that as my answer okay question number 12 uh, pre-band um, an artist who was in one band and then became famous in another I went with uh, this is Santana this is their album Caravanserai and Neil Schoen and Greg Rowley were still in the band I think this was the last album with them with uh, Santana before they went on to form Journey and, of course, they had many monster hits um, in the late 70s and 80s. And probably even became more successful than Santana. But uh, back in this era, which is, I think this came out in 72, they were still in the band. And this was really the beginning of a new direction for Santana's music. He 
went more in a fusion direction for the next several years and several albums. And this is actually the start of my favorite era of the band, really. I mean, I love their first three albums, but from this album forward, then you had, uh, I think, Welcome. I can't remember the other ones right off the top of my head. There were like three or four albums that came after this that I really, really enjoy that were more fusion-y. So that's my pre-band answer. Neil Schoen and Greg Rowley going on to form Journey. Okay, uh, question number 13, a musical book or movie that I would recommend. This was also VCLT from my buddy Tim, DJ High Noon. This is Jimi Hendrix, Live at the Isle of Wight, Blue Wild Angel. Watched this uh, just last week, as a matter of fact. And um, what a great set. I mean, it's a fantastic, fantastic set. You can see without... Eh. Sorry about the glare. But uh, this came out. The Isle of Wight uh, Festival, I think, was in... Uh, it's in August of 1970. And uh, Hendrix died, I think, like a month, month or so later, so... Yeah, this was probably one of his last live performances, at least caught on video. And uh, it's a really great show. And it's it's great to actually watch him play instead of just listening to it like on a record. So we had this one turned up quite loud on the surround sound while I was watching it. <laughs> and uh, Cora can attest to that. So, But it was worth it. If you can find this one and you're a Jimi Hendrix fan like I am, and, and I know Tim is, he gifted this to me. Check this out, Blue Wild Angel. Jimi Hendrix at the Isle of Wight. Okay, question number 14, an underrated album. Going with Pete Townsend. <clears throat> this is his album from 1985 called White City. And this was also a sort of like a mini rock opera. Um, this album, I think it pretty much flopped when it came out. I remember hearing uh, the lead single called Give Blood, fantastic track, and uh, David Gilmour plays on it, I believe. He plays on this album. And um, went out and bought it. This is my OG copy from 85. And um, to me, it stands tall with anything else that he released, you know, as a solo artist. But it's something that you never see, you never hear on the radio or anywhere. And... Um, it's a really good record. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, if, if you like Townsend and you've never uh, heard this before, check it out. White City is a, it's a pretty great album that I don't think got the uh, attention it deserved or the uh, acclaim it deserves because to me, I think it's just great. So there you go. All right, uh, number 15, uh, batting average, an artist who consistently puts out good albums. All right, I have a bunch here to grab, so hold, please. There we go. Ugh. You know you know who I'm going with, Robin Hitchcock. My wife is shaking her head because this is Fegmania. It's kind of a dark cover because... Um, she doesn't like Robin Hitchcock as much as I do, although she was a very good sport in going with me. It was uh, last January in 2019. We went to see him at a very small show, and his flight was delayed. Oh, this is the Planet England single. This, is, this actually is out of order. I should put this at the end, because this is the newest one. <clears throat> and... Um, He was like an hour late to his show, so he ended up playing, I think he played longer, but um, it was one of those days where I had to work uh, first shift, so I had to get up at like 5 in the morning, and it was already like midnight, so even though he wasn't quite done playing, and I know he was doing signings afterwards, which really kills me, because I really wanted to get something signed by him. Um... We had to go, unfortunately. So 
I'm hoping somewhere down the road we'll be able to catch him again and hopefully I can get something signed by him or even a picture that would be, that would have been nice too but yeah and I didn't even include his, the soft boys albums that I have I forgot about that but um yeah there's even a couple uh there's a couple that I'm missing I know but for my money even though my wife doesn't care for him I think Robin Hitchcock is just great so there you go that's my answer and this of course is Planet England show that one recently okay question number 16 same album different cover this was tough because I don't have multiple albums in my collection all that often but I have the uh, David Bowie box set called who can I be now and it features the Station to Station album. This is the original black and white cover. And this is the color cover because this features, uh, it's the 2010 mix of this album. I guess it was re-released in 2010. So this was pretty much my only choice for this question because like I said, I don't have multiple copies of albums. So I went with Mr. Bowie and this is my favorite album of his. Anyway, so although I swear I, I could have seen, I saw this album cover before. It was either in a store. I don't know where, but I know I've seen this other than in this box set, the color version of this. But there you go. That's neither here nor there. <clears throat> All right. Question number 17. An album bought cheap that's now worth money. I've showed this one before, show it again. Flaming Pie by Paul McCartney. I bought this copy sealed for a dollar at an estate sale, like four or five years ago now. And um, of course it's not sealed anymore, I've played it. It's a good album, but uh, like the median price for this on Discogs is around like 150. So, cause this is a original copy from 97. So this is pretty much this is probably one of my most valuable albums in my collection. I was going to do, uh, when I was doing my Discogs project, entering in all my albums on Discogs, um, they had some features that they took away, like just after I finished, and you could rank, you know, your most expensive and your least expensive albums, and I was going to do videos on that. And this would have been in that list if I was just going to do like a top 10, you know, most expensive. But that feature is gone now so <laughs> and the list changed a lot from when I was entering them so but this one stays pretty steady in value so and short of getting something for free is probably nothing's gonna beat this in terms of what I paid versus what it's worth so yeah <clears throat> all right we are closing in on the end here number 18 favorite drummer now I know there's plenty of obvious choices to go with favorite drummer and my pick is not because I'm trying to be weird or different or obscure but Al Jackson who was the drummer for Al Green during his high records heyday in the 70s has such an awesome drum sound and these these songs just are made by his drum sound and his drum tone you know let's stay together here i am tired so tired of being alone um call me love and happiness listen to those and try to imagine a different drum sound and it wouldn't be the same song just i just love the way the drum sound and a lot of times when i play al green or listen to, to him I, I focus in on the drums believe it or not besides his singing so I know he's not flashy, he's not, you know, a virtuoso, like, you know, pick whatever one you want, but for my money, Al Jackson, who I believe he also drummed for the, uh, the MGs, he was in Booker T and the MGs too, if I remember correctly, and then he went on to be a session drummer for Al Green, but love his sound, love his work. And this is a great album featuring some great drums by 
L. Jackson. Okay, question number 19. Uh, an album turning 20 in 2020. P.J. Harvey, Stories from the City, Stories from the Sea. This was also a fairly easy one for me because I think this is like the only album that I have on vinyl that's from 2000. So I know I've shown this one before. This is um, probably my favorite album by hers. It's easily her most accessible. Um, in fact, I picked up another of her albums that I haven't played yet, but there's kind of an amusing story that goes with it, but I'll put that off for another time. But uh, yeah, this album came out in 2000, and I can't believe it's 20 years old already. This is, this is crazy. So, PJ Harvey, we love her. Whatever happened to PJ Harvey? She's still making records. All right. Now, this last question, I know my buddy Bill is going to love from the vinyl verse. Bill, if you're watching and you made it to the end, because I'm 26 minutes out, this is for you. Question. Trilogy of albums. I went with... Wind and Wuthering by Genesis, followed by A Trick of the Tale, followed by Seconds Out. I think I have the order right on the releases for these. But, and, and the question says there should be like a connecting thread. With all three of these albums, this was these were made pretty quickly, one after the other, after Peter Gabriel left the band. And... I think people were kind of writing Genesis off, you know, once that happened. And for my money, I love these albums just as much as the ones with Peter Gabriel. And especially, you know, like Trick of the Tail, I actually like even more. I know it's probably heresy to say, but I like it more than, you know, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Although I, I, I freely admit to having, I need to spend more time with that album and give it a few more listens. But it just seemed like it was very dense and impenetrable, whereas this is very accessible. But the mood and tone of, of these two albums especially, you know, and then Seconds Out is, is a great double live release featuring more or less the same band, you know, before uh, Steve Hackett left, that, <clears throat> that for my money you know, stands tall in, in the Genesis catalog. And like I said, musically, it's, it's every bit as good to me as the stuff with Gabriel. So, Bill, if you're watching that, that's for you, buddy, because you're the Genesis king. It's not the only reason why I did it, though. But when I was looking through my collection and I saw these, I was like, ooh, that, that's, that is a good uh, set of three albums to pick. So that's what I did. All right, that's it. That's my vinyl tag for the 2020, and we're 28 minutes. So I'm going to quit talking, and uh, the sun is shining in my eyes as I'm trying to wrap this up. So I'm going to say peace. Can't wait to watch a lot of other vinyl tag videos. Hope you enjoyed mine, and um, I'll see you all again soon. So take care.